Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Lesnevich. I'm the Senior Director of Cultural Tourism for Choose Chicago. You got to hear from our board chair, our president, um, during the opening remarks. So thank you for being here. I get the pleasure of not only promoting Chicago to the world, but also organizing special events um, here in the city. So that's why I am moderating. We have a great group of panelists with me today for this session. We have Jennifer Johnston, Johnson Washington, first deputy commissioner of DCASE. We have Juan Calderon. He is the chief executive officer for the Puerto Rican Cultural Center. Sarah Wilson, Executive Director, Uptown United and Uptown Chamber of Commerce. And Eric Williams, Founder and Creative Director of The Silver Room. Today we just want to talk about, you know, special events in neighborhoods, how to get started. Some of our best practices, we've all done neighborhood events um, throughout the city. I helped create the Chicago Friday Night Flights program in 2017, which is a series of craft beer tasting events throughout the city. So I get to pull three to four special event permits per year. And I know all my fellow panelists have experience. So we're just gonna share some of our best practices, some of the major aspects that we feel is important about you know, organizing and promoting a special event in your neighborhood. And then of course, we wanna hear from you and we'll have some Q&A at the end. So um, without further ado, I thought I would start very, very basic and ask Jennifer, what sort of events are we talking about that need a special event um, permit through the city of Chicago because there's quite an array. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Chicago Cultural Center. I, got the I have the privilege of working here every day. My office is on the other side of the building, so welcome. Um, a special event permit in the city of Chicago is required for outdoor events only, and only if one or more of the following apply to you. If you close a city street, if you're gonna prepare or sell food, either on public or private property, if you're gonna serve or sell alcohol, if you're selling merchandise, if you have tents larger than 400 square feet, so that's a 20 by 20 or larger requires a permit, or stages over two feet tall require a permit from the Chicago Building Department. I will wanna say the Building Department has instituted new rules Stage permitting and large tent permitting is a 14-day minimum process. They will not allow you to apply for a permit less than 14 days before, and that's brand new. So we've already got some rejected permits because they're within the window. So please spread the word about that. Um, I will also say that bar crawls also require a special event permit if they expect to exceed 500 participants, if they include five or more stops um, participating in uh, participating establishments or if they include three stops within one block the special event permit is required simply to help plan city services make the commander of the area aware we realize those activities are indoors but they have an impact on the public way so that's why they require a special event permit so that's the long and short of it Thank you, Jennifer. And then I thought I would just turn to each panelist just so the crowd has a little bit of knowledge of what sort of events you all organize. And um, again, if you want to introduce yourself and just tell us uh, about some of the events you organize. And I'll start down at the end with Eric. Oh, hey. Uh, my name is Eric Williams. Uh, people know me from the Silver Room Block Party, which started off as actually a actual block party. So I've been working with Jennifer for how long has it been? <laughs> A very long time. 15, 15 years, probably? Yeah, a long, long time. So we started off as a just a block party permit, which is very simple. You block it off a public way, you know, no alcohol, no retail vendors, is pretty simple. Then you move forward to an actual uh, permit, which everything that she mentioned, which is all the things, which is the liquor, which is the you know, vendors, which is, you know, all the stuff. It's a lot. It's a, it's a lot. It's a lot of work that goes into that. So. Um, people don't understand, another big thing that people don't understand is when you do an event on a public street, uh, you can't charge. So it's donations only. And as we know, most people don't donate. So that's a huge, huge, huge uh, issue because you, you, it's hard as an individual promoter, it's just me, I'm not a 
chamber, it was just me doing this, you can't really, you can't charge. So the events you see in the city that are paid events are mostly on park district territory. So that's a whole other thing to deal with. Now it's like the case and the park district and the city. So it's a lot of different you know, permits and just trying to like navigate the city structure. Luckily we have Jennifer who's been super helpful for us. So we kind of figured it out a little bit, so. Thank you, Eric. Sarah, tell us a little bit about the events you organize. So we have two big events every year that uh, we work very closely with DKs on. One is our Lunar New Year Parade, um, which does require extensive street closure, but we there's no vendors or anything of that nature, so it's a pretty standard permitting process, um, which makes it very easy. Our uh, more known one, other than the parade, is Argyle Night Market. So what started out as a true farmer's market and working with DKs has evolved into a, this year, nine weeks, um, weekly event where we shut down the street and it is to emulate what you would experience if you're in Southeast Asia at a food market. So that lends itself to a whole host of other challenges um, that we can kind of get into um, throughout this panel discussion, but those are our two big events on, up here in Uptown. Thank you, Sarah. And Juan, you probably put on two of huge events, some of the largest that we organize here. So tell us a little bit about your events. Yeah, so the Puerto Rican Cultural Center, um, which is celebrating 50 years this year, uh, right. celebrates two events. The first event is the, uh, the parade, the People's Parade, the Puerto Rican People's Parade, that uh, pays homage to, the, to our Puerto Rican culture and identity, and so we celebrate that in June. We're getting ready to celebrate it this Saturday, June 10th. It's our 45th year uh, celebrating uh, the Puerto Rican Parade. And then the second festival that we produce is the last festival of the city, which is Labor Day weekend, is a free festival called Fiesta Boricua de Bandera a Bandera. Every year we bring a, uh, a mayor of a town in Puerto Rico because we're commemorating lo mejor de nuestros pueblos, the best of our towns. And so we, we want this, the Chicagoans and the people of the Midwest to be able to experience local artists from Puerto Rico. This year we're actually bringing the town of Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. It marks our 30th year as Fiesta Boricua. Um, and Aguadilla is a small town of 54,000 people in Puerto Rico, uh, estimated. And, they, um, and we're looking forward to it, so. Thank you, I appreciate it. So I feel the permitting process over the last seven years that I've been doing it has gotten better. Um, it's a little more automated. There's amazing resources on your website, uh, Jennifer. There's webinars, um, really helpful tips. But it can still be a little time consuming, um, sometimes daunting if you've never done one. And so, you know, I just thought we'd cover some of the major aspects that I have felt are really important to getting your approvals. And, um, but I wanna, I'm gonna start with Sarah and just tell us how you get started. How far do you work out? What's kind of your timing? Yeah, how do you get started with, let's just say, Argyle Night Market? So that one, our director of partnership and events, we start the planning process, I want to say about four months, five months in advance, um, mostly because of the changes that have occurred over the last couple of years with COVID and the efficiencies. We now know a lot more this year than we did last year, and that's because of the automation, it's been so much easier to process things online as opposed to paper. And all of the webinars have been extremely, extremely helpful uh, for us navigating the process. But in terms of our event, which is every Thursday night, we often have rotating vendors that come in and out. So we're cultivating the relationships literally from the, the week it ends to like next year, we're always trying to get new vendors. And so, from the beginning, as soon as we know that uh, we have funding secured, which we can get to in a, uh, another uh, point in this panel discussion, we are working with the vendors one-on-one -on -one to ensure they know what the, what the timing is for their summer sanitation permitting process, making sure that they've had their kitchen inspection within, I believe it's a 60-day window of when they're actually going to be up and operating at our festival, which makes it a little bit different because we are not a standard weekend festival, which is three days. We're ongoing for, for eight to nine weeks throughout the summer, and so knowing when they're gonna be, it's an ongoing conversation to make sure that they get those inspections done. 
And then as soon as we know that we have funding secured, we're literally starting the application process in the portal, which makes it super easy because you can keep going in on an as needed basis. Um, one of the things that we've learned from last year to this year is to start the outreach for the EMS services earlier than we did last year. Um, I think many of us were kind of scrambling last year, trying to make sure that we had adequate coverage as per the new regulations through DCASE. So this year we started that outreach, I want to say about two months in advance, just to start quoting, because it is the summer. It is the summer of festivals. Everybody is trying to tap into a very small pool of EMS operators. So making sure we have that, that's more of like a two month long process, but we use the same footprint every year. So it makes uploading the site plan very simple because we don't really change it. One of the new changes we have added is having a beer garden associated with it, which adds a whole other layer of um, permitting, which I'm sure Jennifer could get into. But um, for us, it is literally from the day our market ends, we're already cultivating the relationships with the vendors. Beginning of the year, we're letting them know, hey, these are the dates that we have it. So that's about six months in advance. Mark your calendar. And as soon as we know that we have funding secured and that we can actually put this on at the level that we want it to go, so about two to three months in advance, we're working one-on-one -on -one with the businesses. Get your licensing that you need. Get your uh, summer sanitation because you ha we have to have all that in order to upload it and register them as vendors. And so um, it's no less than three to four months to start the whole process for our weekly type of process. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah brought up um, some very great points. The sooner you start, the better. You can start your special event permit in our application system 180 days before your event. So you can start the process six months in advance. Our, our um, administrative fee goes by how soon it is to your, your festival. So the further out, it's $100. So doesn't everyone wanna just pay the $100 fee and not the $2,000 fee? Because producing an outdoor event is, can get very expensive depending on the size. And I'm glad, Sarah, you also mentioned the EMS. EMS services are based on your anticipated attendance. And the fire department has gotten very strict about your EMS services. So the sooner you secure them, the better. There is a shortage in the, in the city. So um, that's a really great point, thanks for that. And I, I will just say a little, um, Sarah, you, you mentioned another good point for me is vendors. Um, not only are you doing the permitting, but you're also working with your vendors directly to make sure they have everything in place because it's actually part of your permit that needs to get approved. What sort of vendors um, need um, you know, that sort of process? Food, liquor? Food. Food, 100%. So for us in particular, um, we really try to cultivate and secure vendors who have existing food licenses um, or like our food, shop, food truck operators. We're a very small footprint, so we realistically can have maybe 20 uh, tents, uh, small tents not adjacent to each other. But really, it's the restaurants. And this year, we're really fortunate that we have more Argyle-based restaurants who are going to be committing to other types of festivals that are going through the process. But it's those who we cultivate the relationship at the farmer's market, making sure you have all of those things in order um, because time is of the essence that they meet those, um, those inspection requirements. I appreciate it. Go Can ahead. I just add one thing to that? A little secret is try to choose vendors that have a 180-day special event food license. They're licensed for the entire summer. So once they get that 180-day, they can participate in as many events as they want to, and they don't have to be re-approved. So it's a nice little trick. We do that with Taste of Chicago. Our vendors have 180-day licenses. And what about food trucks? They are similar, right, in terms of licensing? Yes, they're already licensed, so there's, their paperwork is also simple because their, their vehicle is already licensed. Wonderful. Thank you. And DCASE does now, in the permitting process, I know have their list of um, EMS vendors right there that you can select from and choose from. Yeah. Um, another big aspect of the permitting process, and something you all probably do really well, and I'm going to turn to Juan to address this one, is community outreach. 
you know, part of the plan, part of the process is, you know, coming up with your community outreach plan, how you're going to promote it, how you're going to gain support. It's, it's a very critical aspect of the permitting. So Juan, and, you know, I want to talk to, to you about how do you go about, you know, community outreach, community support, and how far out are you having these conversations? Right. So, I mean, historically, the cultural center has built community by a lot of the, the team that has historically done our parades and or our festivals are still working with us. Uh, the way that we have been promoting community outreach is all through the, the community services and programs that we offer. We, we work with our, the constituents that visit us in our public health space, in our business development space. So historically we uh, purchased about 10,000 flyers. We distribute them. Uh, we, we, as part of our marketing tools, we have a community newspaper called La Voz del Paso Boricua that hands out 15,000 copies for the parade and uh, similarly 15,000 copies to different businesses to a lot of the local residents. So we're doing a lot of marketing and local promotion. Another area that we um, are working with at this point is with Telemundo for the parade. So we partner up with uh, the, the Latino news stations and media to be able to promote our community, uh, our community events through that, through those three I appreciate steps. I appreciate. It. You know, I know. You know, used to have to have you know aldermanic approval. That's not necessarily the case now, but they definitely do. Um, their offices do get pinged still, right, during the process? Yes, as soon as a special event permit application is submitted, the automatic, uh, the ward is notified. I will say, engaging with aldermen is, is a very helpful tool in promoting your event. You ask them to post it on their newsletter, no one knows the ward better than the aldermen. So the more you engage with them, they provide really good guidance often on um, how to help your event. Um, we also encourage, obviously, local participation. We want you to use the businesses that are there in that community, hire people that live in that community for your event whenever possible. Thank you. I, just to add, that, that is correct. One of the things historically we've done is we have a strong partnership with all four levels of government elected officials. So we've, we, we, and primarily for city events and special events, our aldermen, which is now Jesse Fuentes, who comes from the work. Uh, but beforehand, we had a, a long history and relationship with our alderman, uh, retired Roberto Maldonado, and that facilitated not only access to local residents, also getting the information about the two events, but also it helped to facilitate any delays and and help to you know any delays um, in city and government to be able to get the permit or if there's any issues that were holding up the permit, the alderman will submit an inquiry to the department and then we will be able to resolve it if we weren't able to resolve it at any given point. So having that relationship with that with the alderman for large events are very important. And, and I'll just add to that too, and when you fill out the special event permit, it goes through a process of all the different departments that have to approve it. And one of the, um, I, it's it's a good challenge to have is that we've had aldermanic changes um, in our, in our uh, service area, but the offices are still getting up and running. And so cultivating the relationships as early as possible um, so you can flag it and say, hey, FYI, I know you're still getting set up, but this is gonna come in your inbox and we need you to respond because delays for permitting, you know, increase the, the, just the overall challenges of being able to put this on. But having a relationship with the alders is enormous in order to make it go as smooth as possible. Yeah, and I would just echo everyone up here. It also has to do with the su success of your event. Um, you know, we don't want to be going into communities where we haven't done that outreach, where we haven't had those, those conversations with the people that we're affecting by having an event. So having the community support will only make the event more successful, and you definitely need to have those conversations. Um, another big um, part of it is, for me at least, when I, when I do events, is the emergency action plan. 
and uh, the safety plan. Two very important critical components, documentation that you'll have to provide that you've actually thought this through and have provided you know, sound emergency action plans and safety plans. And so I'm um, gonna turn to the panel. I'm, I'm gonna ask Eric first, you know, um, kind of what some of your processes to make sure that you've really thought about you know safety for your for your event and the community that is supporting it and you know emergency action plans for your event sure well you know it starts with the site map obviously you know like you know, just kind of thinking about egress ingress and like what makes the most sense <clears throat> when we used to do it on the street it was different because we had these very very narrow streets now we move to uh, the beach it's a little bit easier to kind of navigate through that but you know, it's a coordination, uh, as you were kind of saying, with the uh, fire department, the police department, you know, the aldermen, you know, the uh, you know the EMS services and security, which we have to have licensed security that's submitted to the city to start off with. So we usually coordinate with, with our security first to say, hey, you know, because they we use people who've been doing it for, you know for a long time. We, our, our festival is 18 years old, so we've been doing it for a long time. Also, kind of just thinking about like what made sense, what didn't make sense. Um, and then thinking about, you know, safety as far as like exits, safety as far as like EMT, uh, how do you get past, you know, these streets in case there's a large crowd, like, you know, where would the truck go down, where would the emergency, uh, you know, uh, uh, ambulance go through, um, announcements, uh, signage is a you know, big part of this, like, you know, if something happens, where do I go, where do you go, uh, shelter in case of emergency for weather. You know, how do we hide? Where do we go? Um, just all those things. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot that goes into it, you know, and it's one of those things that you hope never happens, you know, but we had we had an issue once and actually we executed pretty well because everybody had walked through this, you know, from the very beginning. So when it did happen, it was it, it was it was pretty easy to kind of navigate that. Yeah, you really have to think through these plans. Um, police department, fire department's not going to tell you what to do, you know, what your plan should be. You really got to think through your event, what makes sense, but they do have to sign off on your plan. To get your permit, police department commander's office and the fire department are going to sign off on these plans. So I know, Jennifer, you're going to say something as well. The, the city has three emergency partners that res review all special event permits. So it's fire, police, and OEMC. Um, OEMC is looking for overall, um, as you said, egress, ingress, um, fire department is looking at fire lanes. Signage is key, not just for vehicles, but for um, your, your festival goers also. Um, and the fire department is looking for how you're hooking up your propane tanks and things like that. So again, the sooner you start, the better. And, and we do evaluate and we will provide feedback. If there's more information we need, we'll contact you. And that's the wonderful thing about the portal is that they can message you through your application. Thank you, thank you. Another big one, um, liquor sales. You know, the, if you are having liquor sales at your event, you're applying for a, a special event liquor license, either for-profit or non-profit, which is extra steps. Um, you know, you gotta have that liquor liability insurance. You have to increase your safety plan, as Eric mentioned, um, with, with that security plan around IDing and, and everything around liquor sales. So I want to open it up to the plan panel and what are some of your best practices when you, I'll, I'll start with Eric again, just when you went from you know, your block party to something bigger, what was, what was some of your best practices around bringing in liquor sales to your event? Sure. So I have a liquor license in my name, which is makes it a little bit easier <laughs> not to go through a third party. Um, but again, just following following the rules, you know, like things, everything from like you know, how do you serve, who to serve, the wrist, wristband requirements, the you know the, the color coordination between who's under twenty one, um, you know, making sure that everyone is basset trained, they understand the laws on you know on over serving. Uh, I mean, a lot goes into this, you know. One of the ways, obviously, a lot of festivals make money is through liquor sales. It's one of the primary ways. But some, ours is not a liquor-based festival necessarily, but a lot of festivals do make their money through liquor. So that's a, a strong driver. But you want to make sure that you are doing the right thing so no one leaves your event and you know, gets in trouble somehow. So it's a lot of liability, but I think for the most part, people do a good job understanding the, the gravity of what they're doing with liquor. You know, Again, it's, it's a huge revenue stream. It's also a concern that you're doing the right thing by your patrons who come to your event. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. Anyone else want to add? Uh, Go ahead, Juan. Uh, well, for us, we, we solicit a special application permit for liquor license as a nonprofit. 
And so it's navigating that, that process, that uh, time-consuming process of getting a, uh, uh, insurance for it, getting the staff trained to be, and, and to navigate through all the requirements that the application permit process requires. And ultimately, we have a production manager that oversees it, and we solicit volunteers to be able to produce it, to be able to create that safety plan that we've discussed for, for the Puerto Rican Cultural Center. We, we partner up with our commanders. We have two alongside the strip, uh, 12 and 14, I believe, um, are, are the, uh, the two different, um, the different spaces. And, and, and we work with culturally competent um, security officers, and we, we, we contract we, we contract a uh, security team that has historically done it over the years, and this is the work that they have done um, across the city of Chicago, and they produce other Spanish-speaking events um, and festivals, um, and so it's worked for us in that sense. So that, that would be my recommendation, would be hire someone that has the experience to provide you with the safety plan, and locally, work with um, your commanders. For us, we have the fire station right next door. And in addition to, um, to, to, uh, to working with the police and fire, we, we work with the, the uh, public health sector. We, we're rich with hospitals locally, mm -hmm. and we're rich with FQHC. So we have that community safety space, and we're providing direct services there that if there was something to happen, we have access because it's a requirement to have an ambulance based on a number of events or to have some, you know, experts within the field. Um, and that's what we incorporate within our safety plan. I do just want to say that um, Chicago is a dual licensing requirement, so it is a city and a state license that you're receiving for your special event outdoor liquor. Yeah, I, I uh, start my... Uh liquor liability insurance application really early in the year. Um, it is needed. I pull a special event liquor license nonprofit for each of my events that I do each year. So um, that process does take a little bit more time when you're thinking about not only what license you want to pull for profit or nonprofit, um, but um, think about the timing, the extra insurance needed as well. We, we should say though, the savings is nonprofit. You're only paying the state. And isn't it twenty five dollars? Twenty five dollars if you get so it. So there's a bit of an advantage. Yeah. There's do, a huge advantage to that, that when you're doing profit. your budget liquor budget license. for that. And I'll just add to with the liquor liability insurance, shop around. So for example, we had won a, a good quote last year, and then we got it, and it went up this year, as I'm sure you all are seeing. Insurance price premiums are going up, so we got an increased quote, and we're like, we know we can get a better deal. So you shop around too, especially. Um, if this is something that uh, could really be a value add to your organization, you want to keep the cost down, so shop around your liquor liability insurance. That, that was raised by our permit team, that that's the number one thing, to secure your insurance as <laughs> soon as possible, because it's what takes the longest amount of time. Yep. Even when I secure it, then getting my COIs from the actual company takes me a couple of weeks. Were you going to say something, Eric? Oh, I no, thought you were going to say something. Yeah, <laughs> um, which, you know, we, we've talked a lot about costs and, and, and planning. Who pays a production company to put on their events, and what are some of the benefits of that? Does anyone pay a company to help uh, produce their events? Uh, we have pretty much done it ourselves internally, um, which is a lot of work. Again, we started off as this little small event and kind of what you were saying, like these events, they just grow, especially when they're free. Um, so last year we hired somebody to help us with the logistics of it, but we kind of do everything from every, you know, and people don't see all of the not so sexy parts of the events and festivals. They see, oh, who's coming? Oh, this person. They don't see all of the permitting and infrastructure and calling on tent prices and porta parties and all that stuff, you know, and it's just a lot. So, I mean, you can save money doing it yourself, but it's just more work. So we've kind of, it's, it's a hybrid for us. So. We are yeah. strictly in-house. 
um, which is starting to show its colors this year, um, only because we're back in full force, right, with all of our events. So, you know, we were able to pivot our Guile Night Market during COVID into something that was virtual, into a DIY function, and then it, um, depending on the level of funding that came in, last year was a little bit smaller, and this year's gonna be full, fully open, but we're also doing every other event that it is that we do, and I have one director partnership at events. So it really is an all hands on deck. We're really fortunate uh, at Uptown United to have been a recipient of the Chicago Presents grant, which immensely helps our ability to run this event. We frankly could not do it without the event to the scale that which we would want to do it. But we're also looking at increased costs associated with the porta potties, the all the things that kind of go into that. So when you do your budget and you actually get the quotes, they're coming back higher. And then the ongoing outreach with all the vendors and the time that you're also trying to juggle your other events, we are exploring if there's opportunity to, do, uh, to offset some of those responsibilities on permitting or licensing with a production company. We're certainly exploring that. We don't wanna be completely hands off, but we're getting to the point, like we have to, because my staff capacity to take it on and execute it to a level that the community has come to expect and that we ourselves hold um, to a specific standard. I also have to think about my staff's bandwidth and their mental health and the ability to execute it at the level that people want. And if that means I have to look to a production company, I don't know what Argyle Night Market will look like in the future because it just gets, to be a very costly event for something that is indeed free. We make no money on these events. Juan, do you hire a production company? I mean, you have massive events. Right, so, so we do. We, we hire for Fiesta Boricua Bandera Bandera production company that helps us to be able to get everything from porta potties, to be able to get license from the state, to be able to get the stage permit that now requires an architect sign off. Um, along with all of the additional steps that it requires to be able to do a community festival. Um, that is also free to the community. So, uh, for the parade, we produce it ourselves. We uh, submit the application. It's, it's a much simpler process um, than it is to, to be able to, to produce a, a festival. Completely agree on the parade part. So much easier because there's nothing being sold or there's no That's real correct. vendor associated with it. I, I will say, if you can afford it, an event production company is a, a, a good way to go. Chicago is lucky to have many producers that are very experienced. I mean, they have almost decades of experience. And so what would take you know someone a month to do, they can do in a few days. So that, that's the advantage, but I understand that everyone can't afford that. It can be costly, so um, shop around, though. And, and also, too, by having like an event uh, producer, they buy for 20 festivals, so you can get cheaper prices sometimes, because they kind of integrate that into your festival. Those are great points. Um, last thing I want to kind of talk about is how you go about you know, paying for all this. Um, do you, who, um, who pitches sponsors? Do, do you all work with sponsors in your community? Um, and, um, and of course, we can't charge admission, um, but you know, what are some of the business models you found successful? I know, Sarah, you mentioned you're not making money, so um, either Juan or, or Eric, if you want to jump in first. I don't have a successful business model yet, <laughs> so you can be very clear about that. Uh, mine is far from successful. So no, we've, we've lost a ton of money every single year. So again, when, when Sarah said it's free, people say it's free, it's not free for somebody. Somebody's paying for something. And the public, they don't understand that. Oh, it was free. Well, Sarah, somebody's here to figure out how to pay for this, you know? And for our thing, because it was a block party, oh, it was free. Well, I was literally paying for it out of my pocket when I kind of still am, which gets to a point where you can't, you can't do it anymore. So again, if you think about the revenue streams, which are, you know, vendor fees, which for us, we have about 100 vendors now. Um, you know, food vendors pay more than just basic retail vendors. And then you have sponsors, which, you know, again, you ask, like, when do you start? You start, like, the day after... The, the, the day of the festival, basically, <laughs> trying to secure you know, money for the next year. Um, and ticketing fees, now that we move to the Park District, we have to sell tickets um, also. So people, you know, again, it's, it's like this growing pain of like, oh, it used to be like this, it used to be like this. Well, it used to cost five bucks, now it costs $5,000. So th these things aren't the same, and people just sign up. Sometimes they don't understand that, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, you know, it's, every festival has to raise a ton of money. These things are not small things to do. 
Um, porta potties are not cheap. Talent is not cheap. Uh, nothing free. So it's a lot of money involved for sure. Sir. We do, um, so part of Argyle Night Market has, uh, cultural, has cultural performances, so we do sponsorship levels for every single week. So we can either do a season run, so we're really grateful that Two Chicago has come on as a season sponsor of the stage, so that is great PR for them on a weekly basis because our media presence is growing and attendance is growing, so we have sponsorship there, we have a season market, uh, season sponsor with Great Lakes Credit Union. So as I do my pitches for annual sponsorship, we also roll out event ones. And so for many of our local businesses, um, it's increased exposure and it's marketing costs for them, but people are very stretched because everybody's getting asked to be sponsors at this point. So um, we do get some sponsorship, but not to the same level that we used to in the past, only because we're getting bigger and everybody else is you know, trying to dip into the same pot. I'm going to ask you one quick follow-up before Juan. Um, do you only go for sponsors within the community, or do you look outside the community as well? We, st we start within the community, but then we go out as well. But it needs, from our perspective, there's got to be a connection to the community. Um, we're really grateful that we've had an increase of AAPI businesses that are seeking sponsorship. For example, our Lunar New Year Parade, we had a oil, a cooking oil producer come across our sponsorship um, and found out that that uh, cooking oil producer is in like 90% of the restaurants on Long Argyle Street. So that made sense. So we're, we try to be very thoughtful, but at the same time, beggars can't be choosers about it. Um, but I really do try to prioritize our neighborhood organizations or businesses because it's all about community for us. And we don't, um, we don't, limit it, but I really want to amplify those that are within the neighborhood first. Juan, how do you go about raising money for your events? Yeah, so, I mean, historically, I want to be clear that corporate has, there hasn't, there's been disinvestment in communities of color. And so over the years, we have to had to be very strategic and diversify, diversifying our funding to be able to meet the demand of the increase in production of costs for the festival. Um, so the, the way that we do it, I mean, we work with, with some corporate sponsors that I am able to, to, to identify um, in the Illinois General Assembly with other different lobbyists that sponsor cultural and community events you will find some of those that want to contribute and sponsor, such as ComEd, People's Gas, those are our, our typical sponsors that will sponsor a, commu a free community event. From that, we, the way that strategically, as a nonprofit, we began to um, expand our revenue has been through creating corridors, a health corridor and education corridor, so we have a back-to-school carnival that we're able to get local sponsors from the Chicago Public Schools and or um, um, well, largely from Chicago Public Schools and um, that have been able to, to financially sustain at this point free rides for our back-to-school carnival within the festival. And so we've pretty much looked at every area that we've covered, which for us, we've created three corridors, education, public health, and a food corridor. Um, and the food corridor, we work through our business development program, which works with, uh, we ultimately work with some of the local uh, restaurants in the in alongside the northwest side of Chicago and through that relationship building we encourage participation to our festival um, and those are some of the ways that we've been able to balance our budget um, for the for the festival thank you all I appreciate it um, for, I would add though I'm sorry ahead, no. for the parade is a little different for the parade we have a large community support of different elementary schools, high schools. We have different participation of different uh, uh, social uh, organizations, housing. Humboldt Park is rich with nonprofits. Um, and so we have large support. So I think this year we have one of our largest parades because we're having a lot of community participation in participating in our Puerto Rican parade, People's Parade this year. So I appreciate it. And just one more question, I'm gonna look at Eric and Juan, because I think 
they're both on park district property as well. Um, when you're looking at your site where you want to have it, if you are on park district property, that is, I believe, another set of permitting with the park district. Yes, Jennifer? Yes, if your park district just gives you a permit for permission to use their property, all the activities you do on that property comes through DKs. So it's two permits. Yeah. So any just words of advice when you're doing anything on park district property? I'll start with you, Eric. <laughs> trying to raise some money is expensive. <laughs> To rent the park. <laughs> man, it's not cheap. Park district, they don't play around, man. It's, like, it's, 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 it's private, you know? And if serious, people don't understand that. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's a private business, basically. You know, they have to, they, 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 they get their money. So, um, and then they have rules, too. Even like last year, you know, we, we were on the beach, on 39th Street Beach. After the event, they go and inspect what happened, you know, the impact. So we had to pay another $30,000 because somebody walked on some grass the wrong way or some flowers or something, I don't know, you know, but you have to do that, you know, so you have to be very careful, like, hey, don't, don't put your car on this, on this grass right here, you know, and God forbid it rains, now there's more impact. So just those kind of things you have to think about, so. Thank you, Juan. I would, I would echo and say that the increase in fees is the large problem. So I, I would add partnership with your alderman and with leadership in the park district will definitely go a long way in helping to understand the purpose of the event that you're trying to produce. If it's a for-profit event, there's gonna be an expectation that you're going to pay for that public private space. If it's a non-profit event, like the ones that we normally have, I, you know, there are ways to work with your local aldermen to really promote the value of that event that you're hosting. And there, there are ways to reduce the cost and to help the reduction of cost, um, but ultimately is through a streamlined partnership with the city, with the aldermen, with DKs, and everyone having a clear understanding of what it is to gain from this event. And I think that that's what has been successful in our community in Humboldt Park with the local events that we have hosted is even for-profit interests uh, that are producing events in our park, uh, you know, they work with, with, with the uh, commissioner, they work with the aldermen, and we all come to the table. They work with community groups that ultimately play a role, uh, like Fiestas Patronales this weekend, that play a role in the production of this festival. You know, I just want to add a little bit, kind of what you're saying. I mean, you know, again, I think for the general public, they don't understand the difference between, you know, a small event and Lollapalooza. Like, these are very, very different things, even though they're, you know, for the public. You know, we're trying to do events that's for the community. So you want to keep them free or very accessible. So you have to be able to keep the cost down on our end to be able to do that. Um, you know, we partner with some local partners sometimes in the community from uh, the SCCC, actually, like with Diane. Um, you know, they do a little bit of, you know, grant making and sponsorship because the idea is to keep it accessible. Because if it becomes this thing where everything's going to be $200 ticket prices, you won't have anything that the average person can afford to go to in the city. So that, that's a very important connection. I appreciate it. Well, every event is unique. Every site plan is unique. Uh, we're here to answer questions at this point, so I know each one of you is probably thinking or puts on events, so if there's anything we can answer about permitting, promoting, um, producing, budgets, how to pay, um, we're here to answer any questions you may have, so the floor is open, and um, yeah, go right ahead. I can probably bring you the microphone. How about we do that? All right, go for it. The D-Case only permits outdoor events. Yes, please. Y 
you know, and people don't understand too, you know, the more people means more money, more cost. You know, the, when the first year I did it, 18 years ago, whatever it was, 20 years ago, I think I spent 500 bucks for 500 people. The last time we did it in Hyde Park, it was 40,000 people. And then now, you know, a budget went from 500 to 1.5, um, you know, a million dollars. You know, these are not small things. So people ask the question of like, what I have to pay? It's like, well, who do you think is paying for this? <laughs> so, you know, like, it's, this, is, this is not, so I think it's a mental challenge for some people, because even this thing of donations, and probably most people in this room, you know, maybe not you have done this. You see donation, and they think, well, that, they don't mean me. They mean everybody else, <laughs> right? And so these, you know, chambers, and you know, people trying to put this stuff on, this idea of donation, we try donations, we got less than 10% of the people actually donated. So that, that, that doesn't work. So you have to charge, basically. Yeah, I would agree with that one. Like, people just don't, don't donate. Um, <clears throat> but we also rely, and we try to layer all of our funding. So sponsorship, uh, grant opportunities, our SSA does uh, award um, Argyle Night Market, uh, one of the community event grants, to try and help offset the cost. But it is something that as events keep growing and inflation is still real, um, we also have to think about, we have tried historically to make it as accessible as possible for our vendors that we're now going next year are really going to have to sit down and look at the numbers and see, do we need to increase our vendor cost? What is the cost benefit of that? Are we going to lo potentially lose vendors from that because, you know, there's now this added cost. And so um, even though we have, please don't, like a, a very small, we encourage donations to the organizations, it's, it is... A pa like pennies in comparison to what the overall budget is. I, I, I want to just share that privatization is a problem right here in the city and it's something of our festivals at this point and it's something that we have to explore and look at in, in terms of how do we work with the city to, to, to increase revenue and to see the importance of the increase of production and so not only the city, but the state. There are awards that are made. There are a lot of events. I understand that. But there is a balance that we have to keep as a native Puerto Rican Chicagoan, uh, Puerto Rican Mexican, of maintaining our cultural events annually in our city. And I think that one of the, the things that we, are, we promote is, is, is how to, we provide continuity for future generations. And so, and that's, that's what we do, and we do it with a grain of love um, in the community, but it is a problem, and I think that it's an ongoing problem that we're, we're in the future gonna have to tackle. Thank you, Juan. We had another question up front. Oh. <laughs> okay, yes, in the green coat, if that's green. You know, that's an unusual situation because we do have a weekly citywide deconfliction meeting on Thursday mornings where we are literally going through all the events that are happening that are coming up to make sure that they don't cross. And so maybe it not being two special event permits, but still CDOT is on the call and we should have caught that. So my apologies and I'm glad that you were able to work together. But um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna flag that for the team. Thank you so much. Did they happen to you too? Yeah, and, and it is two different permits, but I mean, they're the same department, so <laughs> I'll talk to my farmer's market team because maybe we need to put those addresses in the system so that that's being caught. Thank you for that. 
Yes, please go ahead. Donations are usually taken at the gate, right? What yeah, are the I mean, entrance points? No, because we're all running, we all have different platforms for which we're collecting any type of donation. So uh, ours may be coming through our Venmo or our Square, and somebody else may be doing some other platform. So there's no central system that's going to track that you individually donated, and then we, you come to our event, and we can see that you've already donated. That system, at least to my knowledge, doesn't, doesn't exist. Yes. No. Yeah. Oh, we don't charge any. We are completely free. One of the stipulations of the decrease grant is that it is free and open to the public. Um, and our Lunar New Year parade, obviously a parade is free. Um, so we charge zero. I mean, mine was based on how much money I was losing every year. So, you know, <laughs> it went from like you know, $500 to $700,000, you know. So, you know, your thought is like, okay, if, if it's 10,000 people, you know, and it's going to cost you a million dollars, and you know the ticket prices are a hundred, was a hundred bucks, whatever, it be, right? So my ticket price is not a hundred dollars, right? But you know, you kind of base it on, on just like a break-even analysis in some ways, right? So you know, I think that's what you were saying too. You want to keep it affordable, you know, but you have all these these costs, like even like just the base cost, not even including talent, which is a whole other thing. You know, it's going to cost you a ton of money. So for for me, I base my ticket prices on just like a basic break-even analysis of, you know, of what you think uh, uh, the, the numbers might be, you know, who, who might show up. If it's 5,000 people, 10,000, whatever. So, um, and it, it could rain, it could be all these different factors that people don't show up and then you lose money. I mean, I don't, it's not unique to me or anybody's festival. These festivals, a lot of festivals don't make any money. People think, oh, they made all this money. A lot of them don't make money. You know, even if there's, you know, 100,000 people there sometimes, you know, their expenses are enormous. And so you kind of base this upon just how can you, probably make some money or at least break even. And I guess, in a, I would say in a public space like Mahalia Jackson Court, I don't know if you could charge. It has to be free, right, Jennifer? Uh, right, now, that's where your donation comes in, though. What, what do you think the community would support, I would say, for you? You know, our events are free. We only charge if you want to drink beer. But it is free. They're open to the public to come and go as they please, yeah. Yeah, the pop court being city property, you wouldn't be able to charge on that. Mm -hmm. Donations is all you can take. Yeah, I was just curious what my um, um, colleagues, they said a lot of things, so I wonder what the modesty was, and I heard zero. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, for us it's the same way. For, for our festival on Labor Day weekend, we, we have a suggested donation box. I think if we've been able to uh, fundraise $3,000 is, is a lot. So less than 10% of, of the population that attends uh, contributes a significant amount, and it's the population that we serve. One of the things I've been hearing, too, from colleagues uh, in our MBDC EDO chamber space is um, moving towards QR codes for suggested donations because mm -hmm. people are so used to being on QR codes now that um, I think, you know, as one, I don't always carry cash on me. And so suggested donation, oh, crap, I don't have That's cash. That's your excuse, right? That's your excuse. Right? Right. No, I really don't carry cash on me. Um, 
<laughs> but now that it's QR code, it makes it so much easier, right? So it'll be interesting to get feedback from my colleagues here in the audience that do run those festivals of, did you see an uptick year over year because potentially you introduced a QR code for a suggested donation and it's just easier for someone just to click it and make the donation right there. So I'll be interested to hear next year reporting out from my colleagues on that front. Yeah, I know that the last year we actually asked for donations, we had about 30,000 people. We collected $7,000 from 30,000 people. And I think the other difference is that people can't disseminate differences in, in events like ones that are put on by the city at Millennium Park, those are free. Well, why are they free? You have to explain to people. They're not free, it's tax dollars, blah, blah. So they don't understand the difference. Well, how can we have this free event at Millennium Park and then Pitchfork is, you know, whatever, 200 bucks. So it's just people don't really understand. So I spend a lot of time trying to explain to people why the Puerto Rican Fest is free, but this one is not, blah, 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 you know. Thank you. And the we, city oh. festivals cost money too. <laughs> right, but people don't. <laughs> they're, they're great expenses. Yeah. We might with be them. able to get in two more questions. Yes, please. It's well said. Absolutely. Well said. Correct. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions we can answer for you? All right. Well, I want to thank you. Oh, yeah. Please. The largest um, delay in a permit is an incomplete permit. <laughs> we are missing so much information, and then we're calling, calling, trying to get your summer sanitation certificate, so we're trying to get the proper insurance. The insurance came wrong, it has to be corrected. So the more complete you can do the application and accurate you can do it, the faster the process. And as it was mentioned before, there are eight city departments that have to sign off on every special right. event application. And we process over 700 applications a season. The other thing yeah. is too, just really quick, I mean, just you have to handhold a lot of these vendors all the times. Like they just, it's their first time doing it, they don't know. They don't know. You have to just literally hand, hold their hand. Hey, you know, checklist for this. So you spend time doing that also. They're not just handing in a complete application a lot of times. And I will just say DCASE is so responsive though for the, like this is incomplete. Like we are a weekly, uh, we're not a farmer's market. We kind of look like a farmer's market, but we're, we're permitted as a street festival, but we have r rotating vendors. And so it is like, they are so responsive when my director of partnerships and events uh, will say, hey, I've got this going on, and then we're you know, kind of figuring it out along the way, or hey, this insurance is incomplete. They are responsive on that end. So you know, DCASE is responsive when it, you know, yeah, I would when it say, comes to it. As we've all talked about, start early, know the permitting process, look through the whole thing, see what documents you have to gather, because um, it, is, it is a lot, depending on the scale of your event. Um, your insurance, liquor, my liquor liability insurance uh, license, you know, I need two, two COIs, sometimes three in different names. So you got to really know all the requirements across the various aspects of the permitting process. But once you get it in and it's complete, it does go very quickly and, and the approvals start coming if, if everything's in order. Um, yeah. Can go I ahead. just make one one little yeah. plug? If if you have the opportunity and haven't, go to our website. There is a lot of helpful information. There's a resource guide. There's webinars. There are templates that help you. So even just scanning that information puts you that much further ahead. Yeah. And of course, we're an email away. So thank you. Right. I want to thank all my fellow panelists. This is just a small little gift from Choose Chicago for all my panelists for participating in the Neighborhood Tourism Conference. And so thank you all, um, Sarah, Juan, and Jennifer. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>